I had just graduated from nurses training and I was working in Northfield, Minnesota. And I remember coming up the steps to go to work and I heard about this bombing that had happened in Pearl Harbor. And, all, and a, the first thing that came to my mind was, oh, are they gonna start drafting nurses? And of course they didn't. But you know, I, that was in 41 and then it wasn't until 44 that I decided to go into the service. I think the longest that we worked was 34 hours in a row. And it wasn't bad when they kept coming and coming and going and coming. But then at the end, when it was kind of the minor things that came in and all, then, oh, we could hardly stay awake, you know. We landed on the first invasion of World War II and that was the landing of North Africa. And it was very secret. We didn't know what part of the world we was even in. We didn't know we was in the Mediterranean. We didn't know whether we was near England or what country. We didn't know anything about it till we got ready to hit shore. They had church services on ship. And right after we had the services, then we were told that we were gonna be hitting the beaches. They had these landing barges that come up against the ship and then there's ropes all the way down and you just climb down the ropes and then jump into these landing barges and head for shore. And as soon as you get to shore, you just take off and, and run so far and just, just duck. There wasn't much resistance when we got there, see. It wasn't like on D-Day in France. Here, this was all secret. Nobody knew we were coming over. If they would have, the Germans no doubt would have just wiped us out, see. That's one of our experiences that you just kind of don't forget, you know. I met my brother in Africa digging a foxhole. Neither of us knew that we went overseas at all. We went to service almost the same time. There was a long convoy going through, and he was one of them in the convoy, but I didn't know it. I kept asking where Battery A was. I knew he was in Battery A. And I just kept going, asking the next one, next, the next one didn't know, till finally one of them said, yeah, they're up ahead here. Just turned right in off the road, and he said, they're digging in. I pulled off the road, and here he was pitching dirt. It was in a real bad spot, I mean, for uh, aircraft and stuff. And he was digging a foxhole. And uh, that was the best meeting I've ever had. Kill or be killed. That was my motto. That's what was in me. So when you get that in you, when you see all that killing, that's, I think it stayed pretty right to its words. And that's what war is all about. Living in a foxhole day after day. I slept with the dead. I would run in the foxhole and they were shooting at us. And there was a guy there sitting in the corner of the foxhole. His rifle was there. And so there was a few other guys, and I didn't know who they all were. You know, we don't know. Hey, buddy, he said, what's wrong with him over there? We slept that it was overnight, see. I didn't know. I knew he was there, but I didn't know that he was dead. He was dead from the time I jumped in that box home. And that was in, I'd say, maybe 8 o'clock in the night. And the next morning we come to daylight and we got the outfit together. You know, he was dead. All we were taught was our duties and our responsibilities. When I was seven years old, I joined the Wolf Cubs. Every week I had to stand around our Kayla and say, I promised to do my best to do my duty to God and the King. Seven years old. I've got duties and responsibilities. And, you know, that's, that was the way it was. We, we didn't think about the freedom to do whatever the heck we liked. In fact, I sometimes say that one of the things that one of my major feelings about the war was it robbed me of the freedom to be a teenager because whenever we started to do any of those teenage things, somebody would say, what do you guys think you're doing? Don't you know there's a war on? <laughs> that was it. My 
best illustration of the way things were on the home front was I had a friend who was in the med fleet and when the war ended they were shipped home and he stopped off in um, Gibraltar and picked up a couple of pounds of oranges and he gave his five-year-old daughter an orange when he got home and she said what's that she had never seen one never seen an orange I had just been made the squadron commander about one month when I was shot down, uh, known in uh, Air Force history as Black Thursday. That was the second Schweinfurt mission to the ball bearing factories. And uh, I was in uh, interrogation cell for about two weeks because they thought at my age and a major, I, was, I must know something. And whenever they'd ask me questions, I'd just shake my head. I could understand most of the German, but I just made myself dumb. And uh, I remember that one guy, he finally got so mad that he took his cap off and he threw it on the floor and started to stomp on it, and he walked out. So then from there, I went to Stalag Luft Three, as well as shooting so many of us down and so many POWs that they opened the west compound and I went there as a block commander. And uh, before the prisoners come in, I went around the compound and dug out all the grass that I could find and I planted it right below my window and I had a little piece of lawn about the size of a double bed. About December the 29th of 44, that the uh, Russians were getting close to Sagan and we could hear the artillery and it was in the dead of winter and one of the coldest winters that they had and we moved out at night to start to march out and during the march I froze my feet but I had to walk with the compound because I was uh, the block commander and so I had to keep walking the column to keep the boys going and we walked to Spremberg, got on a train, and they took us to a vacated prison of war camp that they had at Nuremberg. It was the filthiest thing that I've ever been in, bed bugs and everything, and no air raid shelters. And I hadn't seen a girl from the time I was shot down when I, before I left England till Nuremberg and uh, Young girls were on anti-aircraft batteries outside of, around Nuremberg. Those were the first girls I saw. It was nothing like Hogan's Heroes over there. When we got to Okinawa, we were almost constantly uh, harassed by kamikaze aircraft. And all of a sudden I heard a five-inch 38 shell explode and when I located it in the clouds I noticed that there was an airplane coming out from behind. Well that uh, was a Japanese d dive bomber and he was almost straight above us when I uh, located him. The first blast from our sister destroyer was the one that alerted us to the fact that he was up there but uh, we never got a shot off to him. Things happened so fast. Our general quarters bells were clanging and ringing when he came down and hit us. He came down almost straight down, knocked off the top of the, the main mast. And I was trying to figure out whether I should be on the port side or starboard side of the deck I was on in order to be as far away from where he was going to hit as I could be. Well, we were underway and we were turning He's trying to hit us accurately right in the middle of the ship, I think. But he had hit the uh, deck on the just on the other side of the five-inch gun turret that I was standing on, the safe side of it. And his airplane flew apart on that when he hit the deck. His bomb did not explode. The wreckage slid off the side of our 
destroyer, which was moving pretty rapidly, and the screws sucked that wreckage under the ship, and I think the propeller must have hit that unexploded bomb because all of a sudden that's what uh, exploded and lifted the stern out of the water and almost uh, tossed me overboard in the process. So I suppose I got tossed in the air maybe, I don't know, seven or eight or more feet. And when I came down, the deck was, uh, was wrinkled, so I knew that some explosion had happened uh, on the stern of our ship. The rest of the crew had damage control stations that they were working and slaving at, trying to get as much weight off the ship as possible so that it could float long enough for hopefully when a, a military tug 50 miles away might come, come out and pull it in. But uh, after throwing everything we could of any weight, and I mean I was so sore from lifting things I never thought I could lift, that uh, when night came, uh, I just ached all over. The hatches flew open on the engine rooms, and the engine crew came boiling up out of the engine room, all covered with black oil and uh, streaked with red where blood was flowing through it. And uh, that was the start of uh, the sinking of the William D. Porter. Back in those days, after World War II started, you know, uh, we were all gung-ho to get in and do our parts, you know. It was almost every young man was eager to go. And as soon as I turned 18, well, I, I was ready to enlist. My brother went in, 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 in the Navy in 1941, before the war started. And he was, uh, he was a ready man on, a, on an airplane, and he'd, he was killed in an airplane crash in California on January 2nd, 1943. And I enlisted on January 28th, 1943. And actually looking back on it, I probably shouldn't have gone in this, that soon because it's probably pretty tough on my parents to lose one son and then 26 days later to have the other one leave. But at that age, you don't think of those things. Everything was different than it is today. Uh, we, we had an obligation to protect our country, and uh, we never thought at all about uh, joining up. Uh, everybody around me was joining up. It was just a natural thing to do. The ordinary citizen, they, they don't realize just what the, the situation is uh, uh, when you're over there and uh, under uh, this stress continually and, and then come home, they figure, well, maybe a couple weeks and you're, you're back uh, to normal, but uh, that's, uh, that's not the, uh, the case, so. 42,000 Canadians uh, lost their lives uh, overseas during that war, and we lost the cream of, of Canada at that time. I have more respect for the deck crew on a carrier than anybody else in the war. That's the most dangerous job there is in the war, because planes are turning up all over and the ship is pitching and when you come out of the ready room you go up and you're you got to find your plane through they're all pushed together you know and a lot of props going and they got to move you around and we uh, we do do fly offs but we did more catapults than we did fly offs because it was safer and uh, those are all all thrilling and uh, nothing that beats a carrier night landing that's the most thrilling of all because it's dark <laughs> but uh, it's surprisingly good and you know, we were trained to do it, so it is, but it's, it's always a thrill. And uh, it's something you can't make a mistake on or you're not going to be around, so. Here we are, 14 men, a scout car, two jeeps and a motorcycle. 
and they sent us a turkey for Thanksgiving. How the hell are we supposed to fix a turkey? So at this time, we, were, we ran into this village. We had one kid, came from St. Cloud, Minnesota, Laverne Keppers, his name was. He could speak German, and uh, we finally talked to these people there. It was a, 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 a housewife, and she had two daughters. So I, I said to Laverne, I said, you can talk German once you talk to that lady there and see if she'll fix a turkey for us, and she can have, eat, sit down and eat right with us. So she did. The following morning, we had butter for our, our toast, and where did the butter come from? They had put it in crocks, and they put the butter in that. They made their own butter. Guess where they stored it? A cow dung heap. They dug it in. They had it covered up good, put it in there, so the German army couldn't get it. So we had that turkey, and they fixed it for us. They sat down and ate with us, and they were damn happy to have it. End of story. When they called us over, that was in May, and we did a month of special training. And uh, we were told at first, no writing letters, all beard shade off. Uh, when we start to move, no stopping for anybody. They figured we'd lose 50%, uh, but we didn't. Of all the 19 Corvettes, when it was over, we lost 99 men and 30 casualties. I think most fellows, as young men, they don't worry about death. You know, th things happen. Like when you're aboard ship, you're sleeping in your hammocks down below. You can hear somebody else letting death charges go. You can hear, but it never seems to bother you. But when you think about it, when a ship is hit and that water comes in and you never get out of there, what a life, what a way to end. Sad. The time that I spent over there with the service boys and then getting acquainted with, with the area and the, the, the Japanese people themselves. I ended up getting a mama-san and a papa-san to do my laundry. That's the way they call you over there. I was called Kiel-san. They called me Kiel-san, see? And uh, they, were, they were a nice elderly couple and uh, mama-san, she did all my washing for me. Yeah, so they, they kind of accepted you. We, we just felt they were just part of the family, you know, after you're there for a while, because they were so used to every, We'd see them all the time, see? Yeah, and they were always so glad to see you whenever you come over to see them. Well, I was in an infantry squad, and we were on a reconnaissance patrol. We got halfway down a hill, and I guess you'd say all hell broke loose. There were machine guns and rifle fire. There was eight of us, and we didn't have a chance. We fired back as much as we could, but in a matter of three minutes, the other fellows were dead, and I was shot through the back and both hips. And I was going to move into a small dip in the road right there, and when I'd moved, I got another bullet, just went through my edge of my field jacket, didn't hit my arm. Then I laid very still, I played dead. And that's where I was for three days. Got very cold the first night, and of course I couldn't feel anything, my waist down. We didn't have enough clothes, so we, we'd cut hole in GI blanket and put over our head and use for a vest, and I wrapped that around my head so I could keep from freezing my ears. And I just kept my arm as any place I could that was warm. And the night lasted forever. I didn't think I'd live till morning, but I did. And the second day was the same thing, and the second night, I prayed a lot, I guess. I was brought up in a religious family, and I, sometimes I guess I prayed that I'd die, because I knew I wasn't going to make it. I was getting colder. I was just freezing. And uh, the next morning, two Ger Germans were coming across the field, right down where the, where the, where the machine guns were firing, and I could didn't appear like they had any weapons, but I had a hand grenade left. I figured, well, if they're coming after me, I'm gonna get them. But they stopped about 50 feet out and talked, and I couldn't understand them, of course. But they came and took me out of that little dip I was in and dragged me over to a roadside. 
and then it took off back towards our lines. So it was pretty definite they were going back to surrender. And I'm sure that that's when they got back, they told my company that I was up there. Because about two hours later, I don't know how long later, but later, here come a jeep down. They picked me up, and that's all I remember for the next three days about. But I'm sure those two Germans saved my life. There's one thing I would like to say. Uh, you don't read this in a history book or in the news, but now you're going to have it. The island of Peleliu was 12 square miles. It was two by six. There was the first Marine Division went in on there, and that's, say, 25,000 men. And there was probably 40,000 champs on there. And no sanitation. And after about 10 days, believe it or not, it smelt so bad you couldn't hardly stand it. The flyers that come in there, they said you could smell it from 1,500 feet up. That's something you don't hear about. And then the Japanese never buried their dead. We tried. We tried to bury theirs, too. I got discharged the 21st of December. I come home on Christmas Eve of 1945. They uh, sent everybody home by train in those days. And I took the train from Mare Island, California to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And from there I had to ride a bus from Aberdeen into Oaks. And the bus driver asked me how come I was getting out of Oaks. And I said, this is where I'm from. This is the best town in the country. I, I, know, I notice that uh, Tom Brokaw calls the military our greatest generation. And you know, that's probably true up to a point, but uh, the whole generation was greatest. I mean, the people back home were the greatest. They were the ones that were collecting the aluminum pots and pans uh, and uh, so that they can be turned into airplane wings. They were the ones that were going into the ditch and back in the shelters of the shelter belt and digging out the old rusted farm machinery and hauling it in so that it could be melted and, and uh, made into guns. They were the ones that drove five to the car instead of one to a car in order to save rubber and gas. They were the ones that learned how to patch a, a tire tube five or six times when once would be, would be plenty in peacetime. They were the ones that were given so many uh, coupons for sugar, so much for flour. The whole generation, whether they were in the military or not, knew we were in a war, were doing everything they could in their situation to win that war. And it's so different from the wars that we've had since the Korean War.
To order all three episodes of World War II Prairie Memories on one DVD, call 1-800-359-6900 or visit www.prairiepublic.org.